Good morning, and thank you for being here. Uh, the Committee's investigation into Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill, Merrill Lynch has resulted in an unprecedented look behind the scenes of one of the biggest bailouts in American history. The government forced Bank of America to go through with the merger. Every Bank of America senior executive involved has told the committee that the government to go through with it. In fact, they told us they decided to go through with it, the deal because they thought it was in the best interest of Bank of America and its shareholders. Ken Lewis also testified that no one in the government did anything improper during this transaction. If there are still people who want to say the government forced Bank of America to go through with the deal, they are turning a blind eye to the facts we now have before us. Over the course of this eight-month investigation, the committee has held five hearings, received extensive testimony from top executives at Bank of America and senior government officials, conducted numerous interviews, issued two unprecedented subpoenas to the Federal Reserve for internal records, and reviewed nearly half a million documents. Most importantly, public scrutiny and oversight by this committee has produced tangible results. Today, two days ago, Bank of America paid back its entire $45 billion federal loan plus interest. In addition, under pressure from the committee, Bank of America agreed in September to pay $425 million to the Treasury Department in compensation for toxic asset insurance the bank received, but never paid for. In sum, our bipartisan investigation has resulted in the American taxpayers receiving approximately $47.5 billion. Even in today's world, that is real money. And every member of this committee should be proud of our efforts. And I take the time to salute you for your involvement and your hard work, and it's been great uh, to get to this point. While we have thoroughly examined all these issues, involved in this case, I agreed to grant the ranking member's request for one more hearing to tie up some loose ends that he is concerned about. This will close the committee's full, fair, and successful investigation of the Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger. On that note, I thank you and I yield to the ranking member of the committee, gentleman from California, Congressman Darrell Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. I have already told the Chairwoman that, uh, quite frankly, I do believe she is the bookend of this investigation. She is the bookend because Tim Geithner has never appeared before us. She is the bookend because, in fact, there never really was much there there. Bank of America is a regulated bank. Monies were made available on an extraordinary basis and have now been paid back. Today, in the short time that we will take of the Chairwoman, we, would, we in the minority will ask, where do we go from here, the security of our banks, FDIC-insured banks, the future of banks conveniently becoming banks in times of trouble and perhaps not being banks in other times? These are important questions that this Committee should ask not because we are the Financial Services Committee, but because we are the watchdog of the American dollar and the American process and the laws that are passed that the executive branch and its affiliates must adhere to. Mr. Chairman, I am deeply concerned that in your opening statement you quite understandably said that the American people were paid back 47 plus billion, or 45 billion with interest over 47 billion. I must caution you, the American people didn't get a penny back. That money has not come back to the American people. In fact, it has simply been put back into the slush fund that was created under a Republican president with Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson's assistance. And today, in fact, not a penny has been paid back to the American people. That money is being recycled into do-good causes or whatever the president and this administration would like to do. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to us getting the American people's money back as it was promised. We were told 
that, in fact, we would be paid back all of our money and probably with interest. Mr. Chairman, unless that money comes back immediately, when you look at Chrysler, General Motors, and, of course, $31-plus billion to AIG that Tim Geithner himself has now said we will not get back, it is clear that even if all the other monies given to uh, various organizations through uh, a process of buying mostly preferred uh, debt, if, in fact, all of that is paid back with interest, the offset of the money that we now know we are going to lose would barely make us whole without considering interest as anything other than principal payback. So, Mr. Chairman, this is the bookend. We have only a few questions for our esteemed witness, and we appreciate your bringing her here today. But this is not the end of protecting the American people's money, not the end of this Committee's jurisdiction of ensuring that the intent of law becomes the fact in law. With that, I thank the Chairman and yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement and that maybe what we can do is that with uh, some of this $47.5 uh, billion, uh, that use it to create jobs and job opportunities. So uh, maybe that is a good way to use it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would certainly appreciate a bill uh, authorizing that and appropriating that through the Congress. And I, I look forward to working with you on, on such a, a piece of legislation, which is our constitutional responsibility. Thank you very much. Appreciate the gentleman's and I look forward to working with you. Mr. I, Mr. Chairman, would, would the ranking member yield for a question? Uh, actually, uh, if, if the chair certainly time, could. I, would the chairman? allow me to just respond to something the ranking member said? Very, very quickly. Because very quickly. I just want the ranking member to know there are members on this side of the aisle who share his view about the need to address the deficit and that the, the first obligation of the repayment of TARP money or, or the use of unused TARP money ought to be that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this hearing is being conducted by the uh, Domestic Policy Subcommittee, of course, and uh, they have done a superb job in working with us uh, on, on this issue. And I now would like to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, the uh, uh, chair of that subcommittee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Rice, uh, members of the committee. On December 5, 2008, the shareholders of Bank of America voted to approve a mer merger with Merrill Lynch. Only 12 days later, Ken Lewis, CEO of Bank of America, made a call to then Secretary of Treasury Hank Paulson, initiating a process that led to a $20 billion bailout of the merger and a promise of government insurance for losses up to $118 billion. The chronology of events strained belief. Was it true that the financial situation at Merrill Lynch shifted so dramatically in that short amount of time, as Ken Lewis said? Or did top management know? or should they have known, about the deteriorating situation at Merrill Lynch much earlier? Did they fail to make necessary disclosures to shareholders? Bank of America would be in legal jeopardy if it failed to disclose to shareholders information about large accelerating losses at Merrill Lynch, known or knowable before the shareholder vote. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee investigation has found evidence of possible security laws violations at Bank of America. Bank of America unreasonably and negligently relied on internal fourth quarter 08 forecast created by Merrill Lynch that omitted any forecast of how the CDO, CDS, and other toxic assets would perform during the quarter. The former Merrill CFO admitted that this forecast was not, in fact, a valid forecast. Bank of America knew at the time that the forecast was of questionable validity. However, Bank of America did not do any f actual financial analysis to make up for the Merrill emissions. Instead, Bank of America merely pulled a number out of thin air, which was recorded on a forecast as the gut feeling of Neil Cotty, Bank of America's chief accounting officer. Bank of America simply created an assumption that Merrill Lynch's illiquid assets would almost break even for November, thereby spreading October's bad results over two months. The attorneys at Bank of America and at Wachtel Lipton recklessly did not question this financial information. They advised Bank of America not to make further disclosures to its shareholders based on the deficient forecast and the gut feeling. Within only weeks, however, reality crowded out wishful thinking. Merrill Lynch's exotic investments continued to lose large amounts of money 
causing Merrill to lose over $21 billion in just the fourth quarter. Bank of America went running to the U.S. Government for rescue. When I asked Ken Lewis about this at our first hearing, he told us that he relied on advice of counsel. Protecting shareholders is often, in the final instance, the responsibility of corporate general counsels and their outside counsel. The subcommittee's investigative findings demand the question, where were the lawyers? Where were the lawyers? The glaring omissions and inaccurate financial data in the critical November 12 forecast so obvious uh, that they should have, been, should have alerted the attorneys to the necessity of reasonable investigation before making a decision on Bank of America's legal duties to disclose. The apparent fact that they did not mount such an investigation makes the decision not to disclose Merrill's losses to shareholders an egregious violation of securities laws. The stage for these possible violations was set by former SEC Chairman Christopher Cox. At exactly the time that CDOs, CDS, and other exotic instruments proliferated in financial markets, Chairman Cox discouraged formal investigations of and large corporate penalties against securities fraudsters. Bank of America's conduct was the corporate reaction to years of weakening enforcement at the SEC under Chairman Cox. Chairman Shapiro has made efforts to turn enforcement policy around. Well, I applaud the SEC for enforcing the law. In the case of the non-disclosure of the Merrill bonuses, Bank of America's failure to disclose accelerating losses at Merrill Lynch before the shareholder vote is more significant. Indeed, those undisclosed losses dwarf the amount of undisclosed bonuses. The reliance on counsel defense asserted by Ken Lewis raises the broader question. Will the Securities and Exchange Commission allow corporate management to rely on the advice of counsel defense and then allow the counsel to avoid liability for their advice? The investing public. And now this congressman wants to know, where is the SEC? As of yet, we don't know. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for a statement. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member of the Domestic Policy <laughs> Subcommittee, Mr. Jordan thank from you. the State of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I want to thank you for holding today's hearing. I look forward to exploring the role of the SEC and the FDIC in the merger between Bank of America and Merrill Lynch. This committee's investigation has revealed important evidence of the abuse of power by the federal government in response to the financial crisis. As I've said before, Mr. Chairman, while the actions of the government officials took place in a time of significant economic challenges and uncertainty, there must be limits to government action, even in a time of crisis, and those limits must be respected. We must also keep in mind that the actions of government officials in this merger occurred after many of the nation's banks were forced to accept taxpayer money through the TARP program. We know that in October 2008, this is from testimony Ken Lewis gave us the very first hearing we had on this issue. Uh, we know at that October 2008 meeting, Mr. Paulson, Mr. Bernanke, Ms. Mr. Geithner, and Ms. Baer brought the CEOs of the largest private banks in America to the Treasury Department, demanded that they accept the partial nationalization of their banks in exchange for an amount of money of the government's choosing. I look forward to learning more about Mrs. Baer's role in that meeting and this entire affair. This investigation has occurred to reveal, uh, has continued to reveal the unintended consequences and negative implications of the government's unprecedented intervention in the private sector. I hope that the Congress will apply these lessons as we continue to debate the appropriate regulatory framework for our financial system as we move forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and yield back. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to our witness. Uh, we have with us today uh, the Chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, uh, Madam Chair, it's longstanding tradition that we swear all of our witnesses in. If you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right. Let the record reflect, you may be seated, let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Um, you may begin with your testimony. Chairman Towns, uh, Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Members Issa and Jordan, and members of the committee. As requested by the committee, my testimony today will focus on the FDIC's role and the decision to Madam provide Madam Chair, you want to pull that mic down just a little bit there? Sure. As requested by the committee, 
And, my, and closer, I think, okay. too. <laughs> As requested by the committee, my testimony today will focus on the FDIC's role in the decision to provide assistance to Bank of America. Let me note at the outset that Bank of America is an open institution and the FDIC is very sensitive about any discussion of the condition of open and operating insured depository institutions. In mid-September 2008, in the wake of Lehman's failure, B of A announced that it would acquire Merrill Lynch. B of A's acquisition of Merrill Lynch was approved by the Federal Reserve on November 26, 2008, and was to be finalized in early 2009. However, on or very shortly before December 21, 2008, the FDIC was told by the Federal Reserve and Treasury that B of A had expressed reservations about completing the acquisition of Merrill Lynch. Over the course of time, it was clear that officials from the Federal Reserve and Treasury believed that systemic risk would exist absent an agreement by the government to provide assistance to B of A. On January 14, 2009, the FDIC received from the Federal Reserve a draft term sheet describing an assistance package, the principal elements of which were a capital infusion and a transaction where the FDIC, Treasury, and Federal Reserve would share in a guarantee against certain losses, otherwise known as a, quote, ring fence, end quote, transaction. The FDIC continued to analyze where and how much the exposures were and how that specifically impacted the FDIC. The FDIC's board ultimately was persuaded that B of A's condition presented a systemic risk and that the ring fence transaction would mitigate that risk and the risk to the deposit insurance fund in a cost-effective manner. The transaction also limited the FDIC's risk to a small portion of the covered exposures, recognizing the fact that most of the exposures resided within the investment bank and not the insured depository institution. On January 16, 2009, the planned Treasury capital infusion and the Treasury Fed FDIC ring fence transaction were announced. In early May 2009, B of A asked that the ring fence transaction not be completed. Moving forward, we have worked continuously with Congress, the Treasury, and the financial regulators towards creating a more resilient, transparent, and better regulated financial system, one that combines stronger and more effective regulation with market discipline. One of the lessons we have learned over the past few years is that regulation alone is not enough. We need to establish an effective and credible resolution mechanism to ensure that market players will actively monitor and keep a firm handle on risk taking. We commend you and your colleagues and the progress you have made in moving towards providing the regulators with the tools to effectively deal with any future crises. Thank you and I will be pleased to ask, take any of your questions. Thank you very much for your statement. Um, let me just say to the members, we're going to be really tight on the, on the five minutes today because five minutes really means five minutes to me, which means five minutes to ask the question and for the person to answer the question because I promised the chairperson that I would have her out by no later than 11, 15, 11, 20. So uh, we want to sort of uh, respect that and try to move forward. Uh, let me just sort of ask uh, one quick question. Are there steps you think the Congress can take to avoid future bailouts of, ba of the banking industry? Yes, I, I think uh, we have uh, put a very high priority on a robust resolution mechanism. We have that for insured depository institutions, and when smaller institutions uh, start to fail, they are put into a very severe resolution mechanism that requires shareholders and unsecured creditors to take loss, generally complete loss. Uh, for non-bank uh, entities or activities outside of banks, this resolution authority does not apply, and we think something very similar to the FDIC process, which is shareholders and creditors take losses, not the government, uh, is, is very important. And we think uh, that, that the, the House bill that is being on the floor now uh, moves uh, very well in that direction. And we think this should be very clear and that the resolution authority should specifically ban uh, assistance to individual institutions uh, going forward. And, and I believe that is also in the House bill. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman from California, ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, actually, Mr. Flake wanted to be rep recognized first. The gentleman from Arizona, he yields to the gentleman from Arizona, Congressman Flake. I yield. The gentleman from California. Okay. The gentleman is yielding me his time uh, in order to be expeditious. <laughs> Madam Chair, I, uh, I want to be brief also, and I've got just a series of short questions. First of all, from the standpoint of the FDIC, looking back now, wasn't forgetting about whether the merger was a good merger, the MAC, all the other things that this committee has worked on, 
wasn't the underpinning of the additional money, preferred stock in, as a form of loan, wasn't that, in fact, the most appropriate thing for the FDIC to approve of so that the capital worth of Bank of America would be undeniable? Um. Well, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's always hard in, in hindsight uh, to answer questions like that. I, Actually, I normally find it easier okay. in hindsight. I, I'd hate to have Maybe to easier in hindsight. Well, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easier to, uh, to, uh, to reevaluate uh, decisions that were made. Um, I think the distinction needs to be made between the insured depository institution that had a strong capital position uh, with other activities that were going on in the bank holding company. And so I, I think uh, if you're looking just at the insured depository institution where we had the exposure, there is a question about whether additional capital was needed. I, I do think that. No, no, I, and I'm not problem. saying whether it was needed. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's clear that in retro, in hindsight, right. it's clear they didn't need it because they paid it back to you essentially without it being from actual new money in any large amount. Uh, they passed the stress test, and they passed the stress test and said they could pay it back. Mm -hmm. So I know that part of, of hindsight is right, clear. Right. But the real benefit of the $45 billion of loan, and, I, and I, I repeat, it was not, it's not, you know, we didn't bail them out. We didn't give them anything. Right. We bought stock. We bought the worth of the company. Right. And we, we got interest guarantee and the ability to get our money out ahead of everyone else. Preferred right. stock is not all bad. Right. But the effectiveness of it was to, if you will, over capitalize the company in, in hindsight, but wasn't that essentially a good thing in that if there was no other benefit to TARP, the confidence of knowing that these, comp these particular banks were extremely well capitalized, not as to the stockholders, right. but as to uh, the depositors, wasn't that effectively the good thing that came out of this arrangement? Well, I, I think, yes, the capital investment uh, certainly uh, created a, a fortress balance sheet. I think that was the original intention of all these capital investments under TARP. Uh, again, we were not, uh, the only role that we had was on the ring fence, not on the TARP investment. That was a Treasury program, a Treasury decision. But yes, certainly. Okay. You know, but you were the beneficiary of it in a sense. absolutely going to have a stabilizing impact, yes. The next question is the harder one. Uh -huh. Many banks and not, or not many non-banks decided to become banks conveniently in this right, crisis. Right. Many entities, uh, in fact, fled to the FDIC, and the FDIC finds itself with its funds, funds which are designed to ensure that we never have to actually put in taxpayer dollars. Those funds are stressed right now. Going forward, do you believe that, in fact, in the future, people should be able to run to the FDIC, run to being a bank when it suits them, even if they hadn't been uh, when it didn't suit them? No, I don't think they should be able to do that. Is, that. is that a reform that you presently see on the horizon that would give you that ability next yes. time to say, you better be there early or not come at all? Well, I, I think two things. I think uh, we need a robust resolution mechanism so when entities get themselves in trouble, uh, they don't get government assistance. They get put into a receivership. And I think entities asking for assistance maybe won't ask for assistance so much if, if, if they know that that is the repercussion. In terms of entities becoming bank holding companies uh, and having insured depository institutions, not just for deposit insurance but for the Fed lending facilities, we have suggested that, that there needs to be a systemic risk council that would decide and have the power to say to an entity uh, that became a bank holding company, but perhaps later doesn't want all the regulation that entails, that they still need to subject themselves and be subject to prudential supervision, that they can't arbitrage just becoming a bank holding company when it suits them and then, and then not and escaping the regulation uh, when, when that suits them. Absolutely. Thank you. I yield back to the gentleman from Arizona. And he yields back. Yeah, yield back. I yield back. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I now recognize the um, ranking member I'm sorry, the chairman of the policy committee. Yes, Mr. Kucinich from uh, Ohio. Chairman Baer, do you have any concerns that America may uh, face yet another bank collapse? No, I, I don't. Uh, but I think there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done to continue the stabilization and the cleanup. And I think the regulatory reform efforts uh, going on uh, right now in Congress are, are ab absolutely crucial to that. Do you think banks that are too big to fail are, are too big to exist and ought to be broken up? 
Well, I, I think uh, there needs to, the, the problem with too big to fail is the same problem that you had with Fannie and Freddie. There is an implied government backstop, which which feeds into risk taking. If shareholders and creditors think they have the upside and the government has the downside, that is going to encourage risk taking. We think that's a major uh, factor that drove the crisis. And again, this is why I hate to sound like a Johnny One note, but we really need Congress needs to establish a very robust, very severe resolution mechanism that tells shareholders and creditors they will take losses if these institutions uh, go down. Right now, they're just happily, uh, uh, you know, uh, feeding, <laughs> uh, extending credit and making uh, equity investments. And I fear that they're not really doing their own due diligence in terms of looking what's going on in these very large institutions. Do they understand the risk? Do they understand is the management on top of those risks? I don't think we have market discipline right now, and we need that. Do you have any concerns that banks may be still over leveraging in derivative markets? Absolutely. Yes. And I would say financial institutions, not pardon? I, I think banks is a loosely used word. I would say financial institutions are I absolutely have that concern, yes. And can you tell what can you tell the American people about the security of their bank deposits? Their bank deposits are very secure. Uh, that is one thing uh, we have been very early on uh, with a, a public information campaign. The resolutions have been smooth. Everyone's deposits have been completely protected as they always have been. So there is no question that the FDIC has resources to deal with whatever may come. Would you tell us what those immediate resources are to assure security of deposits? Right. Well, we, we are full faith and credit, and we have a Treasury line and a congressional uh, commitment to back uh, insured deposits. And again, that's been in effect for 75 years. Uh, right now, we have required a prepayment of assessments that's going to bring in another $45 billion at the end of the year, which will, will bring our crash position probably in the first quarter to around uh, $60 billion, given what we already have and, and additional monies that we're going to be bringing in. So I think it's a very strong cash position. We can borrow up to $500 billion from the Treasury Department if we would need to do that. I don't foresee any circumstance where that would become necessary. Thank, thank, you, ma thank sure. you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, now yield to the uh, ranking member of the full committee. Thank you. And I'll, and I'll be equally brief this okay. time. Uh, Madam Chair, you on January 9th determined uh, it is clear that, uh, it is, I'll quote it, it was clear that officials from the Federal Reserve and Treasury believed the systemic, systemic risk would exist absence an agreement by the government to provide assistance to B of A. That's, right. That's really the point at which you came in. But isn't it true that the deal was already done prior to that time to, to give them the money? Isn't that what we've essentially discovered? Right. Well, uh, I, I will tell you, I know conversations that already occurred between the Treasury and the Fed and Mr. Lewis uh, prior to the time we were contacted. Uh, I wasn't privy to those conversations, sure. so I don't know. I, I realize that, that it, we've been very unfair to you in that <laughs> you came in on the tail end of everything, right. yes, <laughs> and only if something was a bank or be about to become a bank holding right. company. Right. Well, let me follow up with this question, in specifically in your role as FDIC chair. If you had a choice, and you were told, what would you like to do uh, when B of A said, we're going to evoke the MAC or give us more money? It doesn't matter who said it, but, right. but that right. occurred. Wouldn't the FDIC's position in the future be go to Congress or go to the TARP and bail out Merrill Lynch directly? This, if they don't want it and there's money needed, and, and obviously there wasn't new management or consolidation in the merger at all. Wasn't it really go bail out Merrill Lynch, do whatever you can do with Merrill Lynch? They're not a bank, and why, why should it be clouded with me? Isn't that essentially the FDA, you and the future chair's position that you would prefer? Well, uh, we think it's important uh, to act as one government, uh, yes, but I have my first job and foremost job is to protect insured depositors, and uh, I can't with the, at that, at that time about a $50 billion deposit insurance fund uh, bail out the entire economy and everybody else uh, with the resources that we have, and I have to make sure that we have credibility to protect insured depositors first and foremost. So yes, investment banks are not insured depository institutions, and it would have been nice to have other mechanisms available, absolutely. So as we're Monday morning quarterbacking up here, <laughs> if there is anything that, uh, and since we've determined that Chrysler and General Motors qualified for TARP money, if there's any mistake made, it was this very lucrative merger that B of A is now happy about and touting. To be honest, when faced with the dilemma, it was a Merrill Lynch decision, Treasury, Paulson, Geithner, they should have made a Merrill Lynch decision relative to 
Instead, what they do is they pushed it onto a bank holding company, and a bank holding company then, cre then had a systemic risk problem which fell to your doorstep and $45 billion of taxpayer money, albeit paid back, in fact, was put in play. Well, yes. I mean, B of A was already a bank holding company. Obviously, this is a situation where uh, Merrill Lynch was not. So through the acquisition, it got folded into the bank holding company uh, structure. And yes, there were significant benefits that accrued because of that. Yes. Now on a lighter note. Okay. <laughs> yesterday, this committee, on a bipartisan basis, moved uh, for a common searchable platform, uh, although not XBRL, which of course you use. We mandated a common uniform platform with rigorous. Uh, structure so that there could be transparency either to those cleared or in the case of assets or information available normally to the public, directly to the public. Uh, what is your experience and, and what would you guide us uh, with, in your case, XBRL and that kind of capability that it gives you uh, to look down and, if possible, even allow others to look down? Right. Well, IT is not my forte. Uh, we have uh, used ex we have been leaders in this area, and I think we've had a very good experience. And uh, I would certainly offer our IT people to give you more detailed briefing on on that if you would like. But let me last follow up question, and I'll yield back. Do you believe that this committee is on the right track when we insist that databases be common, robust, ser searchable, and interactive, so that in fact? when appropriate, the American people can have transparency. Right. Well, you, you may get me in trouble with other agencies, but if I could just follow back, we have had a very positive experience, and I would encourage others in this committee to facilitate broader use. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen from California. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Baird, uh, welcome, and thank you for doing such a superb job. Thank you. Um, I recognize that the FDIC's role in the Bank of America bailout was different than that of your fellow regulators at Treasury and the Federal Reserve. But nonetheless, we have a responsibility to explore all aspects of this tainted transaction. In your written testimony, you note that the FDIC was notified of potential government assistance in the Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger around December 21, 2008. You go on to say that over the next three weeks, the discussion continued about Bank of America's financial condition and the nature of the assistance to be provided. You discussed the case with Secretary Paulson, Chairman Bernanke, and others on January 9, 2009, and were provided a draft term sheet on January 14. This is all correct, I hope, and I'm working from your own written testimony. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's right. My concern is the fact that in the past hearings in this committee, we have heard about how Ken Lewis briefed his board of directors on December the 22nd, 2008, and again on December 29th, 2008, indicating that at least $12 billion in fourth quarter Merrill Lynch losses would be covered by the federal government. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you what happened at those meetings. I, I know you weren't there. But what I'd like to address is this. Do you have any reason to believe that Ken Lewis had sufficient basis on the structure of any potential deal to brief his board with such certainty? No. Again, we weren't privy to any of those discussions, and certainly the FDIC had made no decision at that time about uh, whether uh, we would participate and, and to what extent we would and, and how that would take place or whether it was necessary. And based on your testimony, the government regulators were still reviewing the Bank of America positions and working on whether a, a deal would occur well into the new year. It certainly doesn't sound like uh, it was a done deal, does it? No. And, and again, I can't, uh, we were only a small piece of this, but right. certainly from the FDIC's perspective, uh, we, we had committed to continue, continue talking with the Fed and Treasury and examine the facts and analyze uh, to what extent assistance would be appropriate. We had not made any decisions during that time period, no. Well, this is not you saying, this is me saying this. Right. One, one could certainly read this as Mr. Lewis pulling a fast one uh, on his board to, uh, and uh, to get them to approve the deal. Um, unless you want to comment, I will no, I yield back. I'll stay away from that. <laughs> I'm sorry? I think I'll stay away from that. Thank uh, you. All right. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, gentleman from Maryland, for his um, questions. Uh, now you yield to the, the ranking member of the uh, committee, uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Ohio. Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman Baer, let me, um, I've looked at your record and, and uh, 
professor in, of regulatory policy and very impressive. And I'm just, just curious on a, on a, in a broad context, are you, like I am, a bit troubled, frankly for me it's more than a bit, troubled by this, what I've called unprecedented involvement by the government in the private sector? Whether we're talking the President of the United States deciding who gets to be CEO of General Motors, whether we're talking about the fact that we now have in the United States of America something I thought I would never see, but a federal government pays our telling private American citizens how much money they can make and bailouts and TARP and second stimulus coming in, on and on it goes. So just as a accomplished professional individual, I mean, are you nervous about this general direction and, again, this unprecedented involvement of the government in the private marketplace. A absolutely, and and we think uh, better tools are needed for the government uh, to deal with this in different ways going forward. Uh, we're very much opposed to, uh, and I believe the House bill does this, prohibits capital investments in, in banks uh, and financial institutions uh, going forward. I think government ownership of financial institutions has created not only uh, a lot of uh, public uh, outcry and, and cynicism, uh, but also uh, very difficult issues about uh, bank, uh, what should be private entities in, in, in private sector decisions uh, based obviously on some prudential regulatory standards, but uh, government ownership has created a whole host of problems, and we would like to end that as a, uh, going forward. Okay, with that being said, let me take you back to, and this, this again, as I put it out in my opening statement, was brought out in, in when we first had Ken Lewis in front of this committee several months ago. Uh, the meeting that took place here in D.C. with the nine largest banks ten, ba ten days after the TARP legislation was passed. And again, mm -hmm. the TARP legislation was passed designed to go in and get these troubled assets off the books, free up credit, free up balance, mm -hmm. straighten up these balance sheets, et cetera. Ten days later, the nine biggest banks were brought to the nation's capital. Uh, according to Mr. Lewis's testimony, Mr. Paulson, Mr. Bernanke, and you were in that meeting. And Mr. Lewis indicated he had no idea what the meeting was about. Uh, that they, the, 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 the meeting went with a, a piece of paper slid across the table to the, uh, to the banks, telling them how much money they were now going to take from the TARP program, whether they asked for it or not, um, and that they had to sign a statement saying they were, uh, they were in agreement to that. Mm -hmm. is, is his recollection of that meeting accurate? Is that, in fact, what took place? Again, not 10 days after we were told, the Congress of the United States was told, that the TARP program, the money that was made available, be used for something entirely different. All right. We, uh, I was invited to attend that meeting. I was not uh, involved in decisions about uh, who should come to that meeting and who was going to get what. My role was confined to explaining the temporary liquidity guarantee program, the debt guarantee program, and that was the uh, only uh, the only remarks I made were to explain that program. And uh, I did not uh, opine or comment at all on the, uh, the capital investments piece. We were not involved in decision making, and uh, we remained silent uh, during that discussion. But yes, th these banks were uh, strongly encouraged to take this money. Going and back I, to your answer to my sure. first question, though, were you, were you troubled that day about what you saw taking place in that meeting? In light of it's the fact uh, you just said that you, right. you made two statements already today. You said you were troubled by this unprecedented involvement of the government in the private sector. And you also said in an answer to Mr. Ice's question earlier that the government should act as one. So were you sitting in that meeting troubled by what you saw take place in that meeting again 10 days after we, uh, the legislation had been passed for an entirely different purpose? Uh, yes. Uh, I think two things. I think these decisions were made uh, in the fog of war. I, these decisions had to be made very quickly. Uh, and uh, the situation was becoming more and more uh, uh, destabilizing. Uh, and also, there had been an international agreement to use a combination of liquidity guarantees. We were involved with liquidity guarantees and capital investments to stabilize the system. I, uh, frankly, uh, the, the idea of it uh, took my breath away. And it was, it was quite uh, uh, unprecedented uh, in terms of the private sector system that, that we have. And so uh, I was concerned, and I have Was said, that the first time? Was, did, did you know what was going to take place in that meeting, or were, did you come in that meeting much like Ken Lewis I, and no, the rest of the, we the did, eight other? We, did, we were told in advance who was going to come and that they were going to be asked to take or encouraged to take capital investments. We were absolutely told that in advance. I did not weigh in one way or the other. 
Uh, I confine my role to explaining the debt guarantee program. I have said in retrospect I wish we had weighed in because I think, again, government ownership in banks has created a whole host of problems. And on, by the way, on troubled asset relief, I still think we need a program and, and we would like to see maybe perhaps Congress uh, authorize that going forward. That still needs Mr. to be done. Mr. And Chairman, if I could real quick, I, and I appreciate your, I, I appreciate what you said, uh, Chairwoman. I think this has been very helpful. Uh, if I could just do one other question, Mr. Chairman. The, yeah. The, the talk this week is about using TARP uh, dollars for stimulus for something outside of the, the right. scope. Right. I mean, again, I think it was done already, but I totally disagree with this. Your thoughts, if you would, on the idea of using uh, TARP money for second stimulus? Well, um, I think uh, you're, 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 you're uh, asking me something beyond my pay grade because I, I'd like to confine my uh, uh, public comments to areas where I think are appropriately fall within, within my uh, sphere as chairman of the FDIC. I do think uh, that there needs to be more focus uh, in terms of uh, troubled asset relief. Uh, we still have toxic assets on the books of banks, uh, particularly the smaller banks really did not benefit from the capital investments. The smaller banks are a large share of small business lending, uh, but their need to continue to work out and reserve against these, these legacy loans that they have is inhibiting their ability to engage in new lending. Uh, so we have, uh, we do think it would be appropriate uh, and consistent with the Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program uh, to try to, to deal with that problem. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I would not want to opine about other uses that, that others might want to make of the TARP money. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Congressman Connolly. I thank the chairman and uh, welcome um, Chairwoman Barrett. And I'm going to ask you to move your mic closer. I yes, cannot please, hear I'm you sorry. sitting here uh, because of the acoustics in this room. Uh, let me, uh, I'm listening to my friend from Ohio, and he loves to use the phrase this unprecedented federal intervention in the financial sector. Um, as if we didn't have the worst meltdown in 70 years, uh, a year ago, September. Uh, let me ask you, wearing your FDIC hat as somebody who has an interest in insuring uh, uh, deposits, depository, uh, deposits in depository institutions regulated by the federal government, so what if we did, hadn't had that unprecedented federal intervention by a Republican administration, by the way, um, what would happen to the banking sector in America wearing your FDIC hat? I, I think it wasn't pretty. It wasn't perfect. I think in retrospect, and hindsight always uh, has uh, additional wisdom. So should we have uh, not have done anything? No, we had to do something. And it I'm did sorry? We had to do something, and it did stabilize the system. I, I absolutely agree that with that. It, it need, something needed to be done, and that was the decision that was made, and it did stabilize the so system. So intervention was necessary in your view? It was absolutely necessary. Now, the intervention was that was designed, this came from some pointy-headed liberal academic from some Ivy League col college, right? It didn't come from a Republican Secretary of State and a Republican administration, did it? <laughs> I'm sorry, what are you referring to? Well, the who proposed the idea of a TARP? Oh, the TARP. Um, the TARP uh, was proposed by, uh, yes, by the Treasury and the Fed last uh, in Oh, <laughs> not a pointy-headed liberal academic <laughs> from an Ivy League college. By yeah. a Republican businessman who was the Republican-appointed Secretary of the Treasury in a Republican administration. Is that correct? Yes, that's my recollection of how. Ah, okay. if the gentleman, if the gentleman would yield. No, I'm not going to yield. Um, let me ask you a question. In your testimony, you say that you've got wearing your FDIC hat a direct interest in both Bank of America and Merrill Lynch because they are depository institutions. Is that correct? That's right. What, well, what Merrill was, Lynch is not. Merrill I'm sorry? Lynch, bank of America, the bank is a deposit, insured depository institution. Merrill Lynch was an investment bank. I know, but I'm reading from your testimony. Right. Okay. And, and you assert that FDIC has a continuing stake in the financial well-being of those insured depository institutions. Right. Okay. So what was the view of the FDIC at the time the Bank of America proposed to acquire Merrill Lynch? Was that we, a good business decision? Uh, <laughs> Was that a risky business decision? Right. Were you aware of the fact that they had unprecedented losses, uh, by the way, without unprecedented federal regulatory intervention? Well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, we are not the holding company regulator. The Fed is. And the, we do not approve mergers and acquisitions. The Fed does. We are also not the primary regulator for Bank of America. I understand. We, we ensure them we have backup supervisory authorities. So I think in terms of the more intimate knowledge of that situation would come from the Fed and the OCC. 
uh, as backup supervisor, uh, frankly, we must rely on the primary regulator. If there starts to be troubles, then we move in, but without red flags. And uh, no, as, as with those caveats, I was not aware uh, until we got these phone calls and started looking into it that, the, that Merrill Lynch had such significant losses in the fourth quarter. They were quite profound. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you, uh, we have a, a bill um, that's pending before the floor of the House of Representatives today that would constitute uh, a major overhaul of regulation uh, and for the first time finally allow some oversight of the risky derivatives market, for right. example, um, and, uh, and would, would in effect extend some federal oversight and regulation of investment banking by any other name, not many are left, uh, uh, that none of which existed previously. In, in retrospect, uh, just given your financial expertise, do you think we made a mistake to explicitly uh, exempt derivatives of multi-trillion dollar market from any federal regulation? Oh, absolutely. That was, that was a mistake. Absolutely. So again, this unprecedented federal intervention in the financial markets in the case of derivatives, since there is no such unprecedented federal intervention at the moment, maybe in retrospect we should have had some. I think we absolutely should have had more regula regulation in a lot of areas, and particularly in OTC derivatives. There is no question in my mind about Thank that. Thank you. Yes. And my final question, um, does the FDIC have a point of view with respect to the extension of FDIC that's contained in the, pr in the bill that's pending before the House today? Is that a good idea, to extend the FDIC and finance that extension by having the big banks have an extra fee and rather than taxpayers do right. Yes, we do support. Uh, we have said that for banks and bank holding companies that have insured depository institutions, we would like to be the resolution authority. For non-banks, uh, we will let Congress decide that. Uh, and I think they've decided they would like one entity doing it all. And yes, we think that this should be a very robust resolution mechanism that provides no uh, open bank assistance, no conservatorship. Everyone goes into receivership. Their shareholders and creditors take losses. Uh, and uh, that's the process that we use for banks, and that's what the process that works. And so, yes, and we think the working capital needs for this fund should be provided uh, through a risk-based uh, assessment on uh, the larger financial entities. And again, this could be another lever, another tool to discourage excessive risk-taking. So, yes, Thank we do support you. that part My of it. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. I now yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke Meyer. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, just kind of curious, um, uh, now that we have some non-banks that are banks, uh, right. and Lehman Brothers has been absorbed by B of A, have right. you been in to examine uh, that, that portion of B, a, B of A? Have you been in to examine the bank itself? Have you been we in have. to examine like Goldman Sachs and those folks at all since this all took place? We have, uh, I cannot comment on specific institutions. I will tell you generally what we are doing, uh, which is right now we have backup authority only for insured depository institutions. So activities outside of insured depository institutions, like investment banking, even though they might be part of a broader holding company structure, we have no authority there. That is, that is the exclusive domain of the Federal Goldman Reserve Sachs Board. Is, is, is now a bank, is it not? Uh, it is, no, because the insured depository institution is only a subsidiary of a larger bank holding company structure. Okay. This has been a problem for us. And one another positive thing that we think the House bill does is gives us backup authority over everything in the holding company. Right now, it's only over the piece that, is, that has the deposit insurance, which is not do the you, whole thing. Do you, do you think that there, there needs to be some ability to regulate and have some oversight or some of these off-balance sheet liabilities that a lot of these folks are involved absolutely. with? Absolutely. Uh, yes. What, absolutely. what are your plans to do that? Well, uh, fortunately, the accountants have done a lot of it already. Uh, we are uh, implementing uh, FAS 166 and 167, which basically requires that these off-balance sheet exposures now be counted on balance sheet, so you have to hold capital and reserves against them. Uh, so we will be finalizing rules next week uh, to make clear that you need to hold capital and reserves uh, from the regulatory capital, that we will treat those as on-balance sheet assets. On the derivatives uh, area, the OTC derivatives area, I think Congress needs to act on that. Uh, because of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, uh, there is very little authority uh, to provide product regulation or market regulation. And we've been working with the SEC and the CFTC uh, to strengthen that, and we're generally supportive of that. Okay. You made a statement a while ago that all our banks are in great shape, yet this last year or two here, we've had almost a record number of bank failures within a short period of time. Right. Um, I don't, I, Where I don't do you know see this going? How many, how many more failures do you anticipate over the next 
I, I would not years. say. I think most banks uh, continue to be profitable, uh, and uh, but there are clearly some under distress. And we do not publicly release our fail bank uh, projections, but it will Understand. continue to go up. We think it will peak next year. Okay, but I, your, your comment earlier was also with regards to a lot of small banks are having to absorb some of these. Uh, they're, they're part of the ripple effect of some of the big, big guys here and are certainly under stress at this point. Uh, do you have any plans for some forbearance for those folks to allow them to uh, be able to withstand this and to uh, outlive some of these problems so that they're not going to be closed as a result of, of some of the actions of some of the big guys? And, right. and, and, and while we had forbearance with the big folks and helped them get over this, we don't have right. TARP funds available for the small guys. And if we don't have some forbearance for those folks, they're the ones who are going to suffer disproportionately compared to what the other folks is. And while it may not be a big deal to the folks who are concerned with B of A, it certainly is going to impact a lot of community banks in my district and a lot of small districts around this, this, this country. Well, uh, Congressman, by statute, uh, if, if a bank becomes insolvent or uh, can no longer meet its liquidity demands, it, it needs to be closed. There's a very, uh, uh, def very well-defined uh, prompt corrective action procedure in the statute. We cannot provide open bank assistance unless there is a systemic risk. And that, uh, and then only if the Fed and the Treasury and the President agree. Well, so respect, by statute, we cannot provide that. respect, Madam Chair, my question, though, is, uh -huh. Are you going to have some forbearance on those folks because of the unusual circumstance that they find themselves in through no fault of their own, only being a participant in investing in some things that wound up getting them in trouble? And, and, and they don't have the opportunity, like you just said, for some of the TARP funds, things like this. Is there a willingness on your part mm -hmm. to, to look at these situations on a case-by-case -case basis and say, hey, the rest of the bank has been profitable, it's been under good management, that just this one area is a problem, and therefore we are going to deal with this and, and work with them on this and not close them down as a result of that? Is there a willingness to look at that situation? There is, uh, we have done that already. I think we released and, and were able to get interagency agreement on some guidelines uh, recently that explicitly allow banks to do uh, loan restrictions with the commercial real estate loans. Uh, it needs to be disclosed and well documented and, and only if you have a credit worthy borrower that continue to make payments on a restructured loan. We've tried to do that already. I guess my only point is, though, Congressman, once the institution no longer becomes viable under the statutory criteria, there is no flexibility to provide forbearance. Uh, and I think these rules were put in place after the SNL crisis where it found there's, there, there's forbearance and there's forbearance. And sometimes if forbearance just denies the problem that exists and delays the closing, it will end up costing the government more, more money, which is what happened during the SNL days. So we do need to be careful. But absolutely, for the healthier institutions that can make it, we are trying to give them flexibility to work, work these loans out. Okay. Thank you, Madam, you Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to uh, continue uh, quest uh, questioning um, concerning community banks, uh, similar yes. to uh, Mr. Luca Meyer, because uh, in Louisiana, many of the banking system are community-based banks, and they are uh, impacted tremendously by the financial overhaul that we are looking at uh, in the Congress. Um, Madam Chair, can you provide me with the number of banks that have failed in Louisiana? I do not know that off the top of my head, but I will certainly get it to you this afternoon when I get back to the office. Okay, but, uh, but probably it's either none or, or extremely few. Uh, I I would, I would really need to check. I, I'm sorry, uh, Congressman, but uh, we've had uh, about, a, I think we will have about 140 failures, and I, it's very difficult to know state by state. I, I will get that information back to you very quickly. That's fine. The community banks in Louisiana, uh, they did not involve themselves in the subprime mortgage mess, uh, and as such, uh, many of them were profitable uh, in the past years, while some of the big banks have failed. My question to you here is, um, why are we making these small community banks who were successful, who operated within the boundaries uh, of the traditional loaning uh, criteria, uh, they follow the rules, why are we making them pay for the faults of the big banks through this tremendous overhaul process? Well, I, I think two things. I think uh, you're right. Uh, the over community banks generally did not make subprime. They didn't make these high-risk mortgages. They did engage in commercial real estate lending. 
Uh, some of that uh, was not prudent. Uh, a lot of it was. It they were good loans when they were made, but because the economy, uh, they're going bad now. And uh, as the economic problems continue, more and more of the failures are driven by that. But again, uh, banks must hold uh, certain levels of capital and loan loss reserves uh, against uh, their loans. And if their loans are going to have losses that exceed uh, their capital capabilities, uh, they become insolvent. Or if they can't uh, meet their liquidity demands, if depositors want to withdraw money and they can't have enough cash to do that, uh, then they need to be resolved. And, and that is, again, there's a fairly well-defined procedure in our statute to do that. I think this is, is this Congress, uh, you know, again, back to the conversation about the appropriate use of TARP going forward and troubled asset relief. I think this is ripe area for, especially for smaller banks, to provide some assistance for continued need for troubled asset relief for the smaller institutions, and we'd be very strongly supportive. But our statute does not allow us to provide open bank assistance to large or small institutions, again, unless it's under this very narrow systemic risk. But it seems to me exception. that the small banks are being pen uh, penalized for the actions of the bigger banks. I, I think uh, I, I am uh, greatly troubled, and I have spoken out about this for a long time, of the disparate, the different treatment between large and small. And the very large uh, get the TARP money and, and get the support, and the small ones get closed. I don't like that. Uh, going forward, I'd like to close the big ones, too. <laughs> I mean, I think that's really, if we're going to have a free market system, not a free-for-all system, but a free market system, I think going forward, the resolution regime needs to be able to work for small and large institutions, and right now it can only work for the smaller ones. But the immediate problem, you're right, it's not fair. And we have said that TARP uh, needs to, we need to figure out a way to make TARP work better for the smaller institutions. And I, again, again, with troubled asset relief, uh, not so much capital investments, I think that's a problem. But troubled asset relief, providing support there uh, to help them get rid of these bad loans so they can make new loans, I, we're very supportive of that and work with Treasury, work with Congress on trying to make those programs more effective. Can you explain to me, um, I, I agree with you that the, bigger, the big bank institutions that were involved in the subprime mortgage loans, we need to have a better mechanism of overseeing their, their operations. But can you explain to me how regulating the smaller community banks that are already regulated by state law, how would that improve our country's financial health uh, when they have been profitable when they have been um, following uh, the uh, traditional methods of loaning. They would not uh, involve uh, or did not contribute to this financial mess. How would regulating them improve our financial health? Um, first of all, no Louisiana failures. My staff just handed me a note, so no, no failures in your state. I think uh, we provide uh, supervision, obviously, of, of, of uh, small and large banks because they have deposit insurance. So there's a government exposure there. Uh, if they get in trouble, we always protect the insured depositors. So with that comes prudential, comes prudential supervision, and that's been the case for over 75 years. I think uh, moving forward, uh, my concern uh, from a supervisory perspective with the smaller banks is helping them diversify their balance sheet uh, because of unevil, uh, unlevel playing fields between small, large and small institutions, as well as between insured depository institutions and the shadow sector, the non-bank sector. Uh, community banks have been uh, relegated to primarily to commercial real estate lending and small business lending, and they provide good support for their communities in those two areas. But they have not; they don't have much diversification. They got the loan, the mortgages taken away from them, a lot of the consumer credit taken away from them, uh, and I think a lot of that has been, been uh, driven through un un unlevel regulatory requirements. So going forward, I would like to see if we can change that uh, to help them further diversify their balance sheet and get back to way, where we used to be with community banking, where they were in a position to, to uh, offer a more full range of, of services to their communities. The gentleman's time Thank has expired. Much. Let me um, uh, announce that um, we have three minutes left on the vote, and of course we will return ten minutes after the last vote, I understand there's three votes. Um, Madam Chair, let me thank you very much for coming this morning. And uh, we will now recess until 10 minutes after the last vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Committee in recess. <laughs>